Hi everyone, this is GKCS. In this video, we'll be talking about API gateways. This is a common design pattern used across distributed systems and across companies uh, to accept requests, which is basically expose your internal APIs to the external world. So before we start, uh, I just want you to understand where the placement of this API gateway is in this architecture. You have on the extreme right databases, which serve you data. You have on the extreme left, these client devices, which is mobiles and uh, desktops. But the API gateway sits right here in the middle, okay, uh, between payments, posts, and any other internal microservices that you have. You don't want these microservices to talk to the external world directly. You want some sort of extraction of common logic, and you also want to bring in some security. Uh, so one of the things that you can bring in is a guard, which is like a gateway and uh, you want to expose the APIs that payments and posts wants to expose to the outside world through this gateway. Okay, the benefit, like we said, is number one, when requests come in here, you can go for authorization. Is this user, is Gaurav allowed to make this request to the payment service? Uh, you might make the argument that payments should take care of that logic, but some kind of authorization or authentication is common across services. So that logic can be extracted out and put into the API gateway itself. The other thing you might want to do is you might want to transform this request. So for example, you have a JSON request uh, sent by all clients uh, and uh, this JSON request has a lot of fields which may or may not be relevant to a service. So clients don't want to change their code from time to time. They don't also want to you know, create requests according to each service. They want to create generic requests for every service and just send that across. But the gateway, can construct that request and see if a service like payments or posts wants that request in a particular way. So you can transform the data, you can massage the data, you can add a user agent, you can do lots of stuff here. Uh, the other thing is validation, just making sure that the request is correct or incorrect. So the benefit of the gateway is that it's talking to internal services. So payments can tell the API gateway that, hey, I want a request in this format. These things are compulsory, these things are not compulsory. You could, like I said, expose this directly or when you get the request, you can validate the request internally. The benefit of doing this on the API gateway though, is that the request fails immediately. You don't even get that request on your side. So you may or may not do validation on the gateway. Uh, you could do it on the payment service also. Another thing is rate limiting. This is a possibility. I should put stars on validation and rate limiting because you may or may not do rate limiting on this side. If there's a lot of requests coming in, someone's trying to flood your server, a DDoS attack, uh, API gateways are ideal to handle that attack, to write codes so that you don't allow too many requests coming in from one user, whether maliciously or just because there's a bug in the client. Another thing is routing. You get a request and then you have to figure out, hey, where does this request go to? So if you have something like interviewready.io slash learn, that will go to the learn microservice slash something. So that will hit an API in the learn microservice. Okay. So in our example here, you might have interviewready slash posts slash comment question mark comment ID equal to one to three. So what happens here is that you hit the posts microservice and then you go to the comment API in the post microservice. And then you also pass in this parameter one to three. So post knows that I have to go to my database, get that exact comment of one, two, three, because the API of comment has been hit. And then it gives a response to the API gateway, which returns to the client. So that's how you do the routing here. The benefit of this is that the API gateway knows the routing exactly. The clients don't need to hit different servers based on different requests. Uh, they don't need to do any kind of DNS lookup. They know one server, hit it, and it will figure out where to send the request to. Finally, load balancing. This is also a benefit, a possible benefit, I should say, of gateways. When the request reaches the gateway, it might see that there are multiple machines which are running the post service. So you have five machines which are running the post service. Which one should I send it to? So the one with the least load, or maybe the one which got the request uh, the earliest. So you sent a request to one, two, three, four, five. The next request should go back to one because one got it a long time back. So maybe the load on that server is low. But depending on your load balancing policy, uh, you'll see the gateway behave in different ways. 
Like I said, this is also a star. It may or may not do this. It might do this entirely randomly. Just hit any node that you see. Um, it might also be smart that it has a health check. It knows that which nodes are alive or not. But after a certain period of time, you're seeing that a lot of logic and a lot of complexity is coming into this single gateway. It's like a like a super person. Um, so at that time, you probably want to extract out some of this logic from the gateway also and move it into different services. Uh, for example, this load balancing can be a different service itself. And uh, that could maintain the routing tables also. So it could be a service registry. Now, a lot of stuff happens when a person makes a request to a gateway also. It's not as simple as just hit an HTTP request and get a response. Uh, firstly, these gateways can scale horizontally. So which gateway should you hit is a question. Should I hit the API gateway in India, staying in India, or should I hit the one in the US? So it kind of depends because the US one is really far, but if the Indian one is overloaded, shouldn't I hit the US one? This is tough. And who's going to do the load balancing if the API gateway is responsible for the load balancing? So in this case, uh, there's a helpful system, which is DNS. DNS is not a part of your system, uh, usually. DNS are part of the internet backbone. Uh, these servers map domain names, which is like api.intubrary.io, to an IP address. So 192.1.1.1. This is obviously not the IP address that we are at, but uh, if you type in a URL, facebook.com, intubrary.io, google.com, uh, this will map to an IP address, which is literally a machine on the internet, which can be connected to. But remembering IP addresses is insane. Humans don't do that. So you need a label for that IP address, which is a domain name. You can purchase this. Uh, GoDaddy is a popular website. I purchased it from there. And then you need to have a DNS. Uh, so something which maps this domain to the IP address. Again, GoDaddy does this because it's, <laughs> it's their business. Of course, this costs them some money. Uh, this is like you renting out some land. You're saying that this label is mine, this trademark is mine, nobody else can come to it. Um, but really, there's nothing stopping a person from mapping any address to any other IP address. It's just that everyone trusts GoDaddy. And therefore, when you make a connection request, you usually connect with known DNS. So if I come in and I am able to somehow hack into your computer or hack into your router, and I force it to send it to my DNS, I can take facebook.com and send it to my website. Okay, uh, this is harder than it looks, but yes, it is possible. Uh, and so that's interesting. Just wanted to put it out there. I don't know why. <laughs> the second thing is CDNs. Before you connect to the API gateway, a lot of the load can be taken away by CDNs. These are content delivery networks. The basic idea being that if you have anything which is static, uh, if you have images or video or uh, things which don't change, file information usually, uh, then you can serve that using a content delivery network. Uh, the name is a little deceptive. Content delivery networks are, again, part of the internet backbone. They're spread across the world. Uh, and these are like small databases or small caches, which can store all of your static data. Uh, usually, people put their web pages, which are static, and images and videos, like we discussed, in a CDN. They're faster because they're close nearby. Uh, when it comes to making a request, you instead of hitting the API gateway of the server, you can just hit these CDNs and get responses much faster. There are certain challenges you might be thinking about, hey, how does live streaming happen? If the data is being streamed live, created live on uh, this, this service, let's say Hotstar, then how is it being sent to the CDN very quickly? So uh, that's an interesting thing. We have a free chapter on interview ready. You can check it out. But uh, CDNs are responsible for taking away a large part, I would say 90% of the traffic that would otherwise go and hit a server, especially for uh, streaming and image heavy websites. So that's how clients connect. Uh, they hit a DNS, figure out the IP address, go and hit the API gateway. If they have some static information, then usually the web page itself says that go hit a CDN URL, which is backed by uh, some sort of file store. In reality, if you have something like AWS, this is what it looks like. You have this gateway service in the center, but really 90% of your traffic will go to the CDN over here, uh, which in AWS is going to be CloudFront. It's backed by S3. Uh, S3 is a file store. You also have a DNS for AWS. It's a big company. Uh, called Route 53, and you can basically store your mappings from domains to IP addresses. 
as you can see, most of these solutions are provided by cloud solution providers. GCP also has them, Azure also has them. AWS is the most popular, uh, and that's the reason why I'm showing you these. And uh, if you're setting up something for your startup or for your side project, it makes little sense to go ahead and create these by yourself because uh, unless it's a side project, right? And you're doing it for the heck of it. You're doing it to learn things. These solutions are super scalable, super tested. Uh, it makes sense to focus on your product and your USP instead of going ahead and building these things again. Okay, I, I want to leave you with a war story. And uh, one of the reasons why maybe API Gateways is um, a thing of the 2010s now. Uh, what used to happen is we were using uh, an AWS gateway and we were using everything else also over here, S3 and uh, Route 53 and CDNs, CloudFront. What happened is we had services in the backend which used to connect with the gateway. Uh, but one thing which is not discussed usually is that these services have contracts. The API is literally a contract. So if you send a request, you get a response. But what if a new type of request has to be added? What if a new API has to be added? What if the API has changed? So in these cases, there is a change in contract and therefore the API gateway needs to be informed of that and it needs to reflect those changes. So how do you do that? By restarting, restart the API gateway. Uh, this is tremendously irritating. Uh, not just for clients, which will probably see their connections getting, you know, reestablished. It's developers who lose a lot of time. If you have a person in the payments service, okay, I am working in the payment service. I make a change in my API. Now I need to deploy this. It's not just that I need to deploy my service. I need to go and talk to the engineer in the API gateway service and tell them, please, could you change uh, some of the code in your, in your gateway service? So that is tedious. Eventually what you do is you have these set of dependencies, which are client libraries for each service. And what you tell them is, okay, there's this file out there in Git. It's a public file. Go and make those changes. And uh, when you deploy your service, tell me to deploy mine and automatically I'll pick up the right dependency version. Okay. Even if you don't understand this at a high level, just understand that, you know, you have a contract and the contract has a version. So as long as you change the version of the contract, my service is going to work fine. I mean, everyone will hit the API and see the new version come up. And this used to happen for four, five, six services. And you have continuous integration, continuous deployments. And so every time there was a deployment to be done on any of the internal services, there was a restart required on the API gateway. And that's crazy, right? Uh, in fact, one of the new services came in emails, which had a bunch of APIs and a bunch of internal systems which were, you know, doing this. And the uh, gateway engineers got crazy. They used to spend like 20 to 25% of their sprint times just maintaining the service or just restarting things. Uh, so one of the things that has happened is firstly, you don't want to put in a lot of the logic of a lot of the services in this gateway. You can extract out load balancing. Like we said, you can extract out even routing to some extent, uh, rate limiting, of course, can be extracted out and you can put this in a sidecar. It's part of the service proxy design pattern. We'll talk about that some other time. Or I'll share some links in the description, uh, but uh, a sidecar can actually manage a lot of the common things that we would trying to stuff into the API gateway. Okay. The other thing is authorization. You don't really need authorization in the gateway. You can have that as a separate service. Uh, and if you need to cache some of the responses of that service, you can also do that. This is explained in interview ready. What's happened now is that most of the startups and the medium sized companies that I'm seeing are moving into service mesh. Uh, and even better is that many of them are starting with monoliths. They're just starting with, I don't need a, a full fledged API gateway. I just need an EC2 instance. Everything else is either going to be managed by AWS or is going to be in the same service. So that's also an interesting development. Uh, you know, all the hype that we had around microservices is, it has matured, I would say. So only people who need to use them are going ahead and using them. So thank you so much for being a part of this. I really enjoyed talking about this critical system, uh, which is part of most distributed systems even now. And it's really got its own pros and cons. So depending on your architecture, you would maybe decide to go ahead with it or go ahead with the service mesh. Um, like I said, the bandwagon is not something that you want to sit in unless it's taking you where you want to go.
Until next time, see you. Bye-bye.